a number of viewers had a really good question. What's the difference between a graph isomorphism and a graph homomorphism? So that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. Let's begin by reviewing what an isomorphism is. So an isomorphism from a graph G to a graph H is a bijective mapping alpha from the vertices of G to the vertices of H such that x, y is an edge of G if and only if alpha of x, alpha of y is an edge in H. If we think about what this means, this means that the mapping on the vertices forces the edges to map to edges and forces the non-edges to map to non-edges. This is exactly what we mean when we say that an isomorphism preserves adjacency and non-adjacency. Check the links in the description below for more examples about graph isomorphisms. Now, let's define a graph homomorphism. A homomorphism from a graph G to a graph H is a mapping, which is not necessarily bijective, alpha maps from the vertices of G to the vertices of H, such that if x, y is an edge of the graph G, then alpha of x, alpha of y is an edge of the graph H. Notice that the main difference between these two definitions is that the if and only if symbol has been replaced by a single directional arrow. So that's really going to come into play when we talk about examples of homomorphisms. In particular, the single directional arrow maps edges to edges but it doesn't say what has to happen to non-edges. So alpha may map a non-edge to a single vertex or to an edge or to a non-edge. We don't really care what happens to the mapping on non-edges. So just at a glance, you can see that if you had a mapping which was an isomorphism, then it would be a homomorphism. But in general, a homomorphism may not be an isomorphism. Now let's work through a couple of examples. In my first example, I want to show you that a bipartite graph G has a homomorphism to K2, which is the complete graph on two vertices. And this will work for any bipartite graph G. But just for the purposes of a picture to keep in mind, I'll draw an example graph. So I'll draw three vertices, x1, x2, and x3. And on the other side, I'll draw two vertices, y1 and y2 and I'll put in some edges and you can see that that graph is a bipartite graph. Now in this example, we are going to try to describe the mapping alpha, which will map that graph, or in general any bipartite graph, to the complete graph on two vertices. And I'll just label those vertices zero and one. So let's start writing some things down that we know. We know that G is a bipartite graph. So let's let the vertex set of G be given by X union Y where x and y are the partite sets of the graph G. In our little picture example, we can see that the highlighted green portion is the set x and the highlighted purple portion is the set y. Thus, every edge E in the edge set of the graph G is of the form E equals x, y, where x belongs to the set x and y belongs to the set y. This is the definition of being bipartite, and of course you can check it out in our little example. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to label the vertex set of K2 as zero and one. And now we're ready to define alpha. So we'll define alpha, a mapping, from the vertex set of G to the vertex set of K2 as follows. Alpha of a vertex V will equal zero if V belongs to X, and it will equal one if V belongs to Y. That's simple. If you look at our example on the left, you'll see that all of those green vertices in the set X get mapped to zero, and all of the purple vertices in the set Y get mapped to one. So that's the visual for what's happening in our mapping. Now let's check that this mapping alpha is indeed a homomorphism. Well, if we take any edge X, Y in the edge set of G, we know by definition that X is in the set X and Y is in the set Y. So that means that alpha of X, alpha of Y, equals zero one, and the edge zero one is an edge in the graph K2. So that tells us that all edges get mapped to edges, and therefore we have a homomorphism from a bipartite graph to the graph K2. As I mentioned, we don't really mind where non-edges get mapped to. 
So we might want to just note for ourselves that in this example, a non-edge will either get mapped to a single vertex or it will get mapped to an edge. Let me show you those two examples. So I'll highlight a non-edge where there's no edge between x1 and x2, and that non-edge got mapped to the single vertex zero. Now I'll highlight a different non-edge, the edge from x1 to y1 does not exist in the graph, and where does it get mapped to? It gets mapped to the edge 0, 1. So in this example, any non-edge from our graph G will either be condensed to a single vertex or mapped to an edge, and we don't care in either case. All that we needed to check was that edges get mapped to edges. In a second example, let's take our graph G to be this graph on five vertices, which we'll label A, B, C, D, E, and our graph H to be the triangle, and we'll label the vertices 1, 2, 3. Now, consider the mapping from the vertex set of G to the vertex set of H given as follows. The mapping alpha maps A to 1, and it maps B to 2, C to 3, D to 2, and E to 3. Now we want to check if this is indeed a homomorphism. What do we need to do? We need to check that every edge of G gets mapped to an edge of H. So I'm going to use a shorthand notation here, and I'm just going to write down AB as the edge AB from G, and let's look at where it gets mapped to. A gets mapped to 1 and B gets mapped to 2, so the edge gets mapped to 1, 2. Okay, so we know that that edge AB did indeed get mapped to an edge of H. Now we have to check all of the other edges. Edge BC gets mapped to edge 2, 3. And we can do the same thing for all of them, so I'll just write out all of the edges and where they get mapped to. The important thing to notice is that every edge of G does indeed get mapped to an edge of H. Out of curiosity, you may want to see what happens to some of the non-edges. Again, it doesn't affect whether or not it's a homomorphism. But if you look at the non-edge, EB, you'll see that it maps to 3, 2. So in that example, a non-edge got mapped to an edge. Whereas a different non-edge, such as BD, that gets mapped to the single vertex 2. So different things can happen to non-edges. They can either be mapped to edges or to a single vertex, or potentially even to a non-edge. But remember that we don't mind what happens to non-edges. The important part was our check on the edges, and that was enough to tell us that alpha is a homomorphism from G to H. Finally, I'd like to make a remark about coloring. If we think about the vertices of H as being colored with red, green, and blue, let's see what the map alpha would tell us in terms of the corresponding colors in the graph G. Well, alpha maps a to 1, so we color that guy red. And then the ones colored green are going to be B and D. The ones colored blue are going to be C and E. Okay, so basically our map alpha told us how to color the graph G. Next, let me tell you a definition. A proper coloring of a graph G is an assignment of colors to the vertices of G such that no two adjacent vertices are ever assigned the same color. If we look at what happened in our graph G and the three colors that were assigned there, we'll notice that anytime we have an edge, the endpoints of the edge have different colors. So indeed, we have a proper three coloring in this example. It turns out that a proper coloring of a graph G using R colors is equivalent to a homomorphism from the graph G to KR, the complete graph on R vertices. So that's a particular example of homomorphisms being used in the context of colorings. In our little example, we see that our graph H is indeed K3, and the coloring that was induced onto the graph G is indeed a proper three coloring. You should observe that a homomorphism to a graph H can be more generic. The graph H could be any graph H. But the special case when that graph is a complete graph deals with the idea of a proper coloring. In future videos, I will go into more details about graph colorings, so stay tuned. And for now, check out related videos on this side. See you next time.